the McIlvaney Weekly Commentary, covering monetary, economic, and geopolitical news events. There's been really an amazing campaign to unwind people from any belief in real money and to believe totally in government and government-created debt as real money that we can use every day. And that's scary because if we ever lose the paper money or the credit card, which I think we will, I think there'll be a day when the credit cards stop working, I think that'll be the biggest shock in the history of America, personally, because people will say, what do I do now? Now here are Kevin Oreck and David McIlvaney. Welcome to the McIlvaney Weekly Commentary. I'm Kevin Oreck along with David McIlvaney. Before we get to our guest today, Dave, I was just checking this morning before I came into work on an astronaut that now is in his 80s. That's one of my favorite astronauts. He's flown. He actually was back with the Apollo program. He worked all the way through the shuttle program. NASA forced him to retire. And what I loved about him was he stayed engaged. This was a medical doctor. He was a glider pilot. He was a jet pilot. He learned new things all the time, stayed actively engaged. He fixed the Hubble when they put the wrong lens in it. His name is Story Musgrave. And I turned to his philosophy And here's what he said. He said, learn new things, stay engaged, apply with everything that you can, and then keep moving, move on to the next thing. And I think of our guest today, Jim Deeds. We've known him for years. Your dad knew him before you were born. They were stockbrokers in Denver and a regular guest here on the commentary. What a blessing to have him on today. And the nature of relationship as we understand it is just that, that we can be colleagues and also share that relationship of mentor, mentee. We can learn from anyone. Yeah. And we have learned through the decades. We've, with the relationship with the Deeds family, this goes back uh, 40 years or mm-hmm. more. Yeah. And so yeah. we, we continue to learn and, and grow uh, in our understanding and, and, and pressing forward in, in trying to figure out the world as it is and how we should be responding to it. Jim is a lifelong learner, and uh, I love that about him, talking about staying engaged. He does remind me of Story Musgrave, the astronaut, but even more so. He has a need to teach. You know, he'll call you, he'll call me, and he wants to just share what he's learned, and he wants to share it with somebody who cares. What a blessing to have him on today. Jim, you've spent, I think it's fair to say, decades in the investment markets and with an eye to the economy and the impact into the financial markets, particular asset classes, I think it'd be really helpful just to kind of give us a 10 cent tour of where you started, where you're at, and kind of, again, just a bit of your history and background. Good, David. I think it's amazing because when I look back and even think about it for a minute, it's just been an amazing trip in my lifetime, and it's been a lot of fun. And I guess that's what you do in any work that you do. If, if it's fun and if it's new and if on top of that you can earn a living, what else could you ask for? I would go back and do this very quickly just so that you'd see I wasn't driving a cab last week. What I was doing, I graduated from the University of Colorado back in 1956. I took architectural engineering and business management, so had a two-degree course, which actually I was up there six years. The last two years I was married. I managed the married couple's dormitory, and my wife was teaching. So believe it or not, I was started investing in the stock market back in 1954 or 55. So this has been a long, long trip. From that point on... Life went really quick, and I'll give it to you. When I graduated, went to work for Shell Oil out in California for about four months or five months. Had an ROTC commission with the Air Force. Went in the Air Force for a couple of years down in Memphis, Tennessee. Got a good idea what that was. Came back to Denver. Got work in sales, sales engineering, working with architects, ready-mix concrete people, and builders. And it was a neat time, and that went on for eight years. That was back through about 1967, and in those eight years, Denver was booming. So it was a fun place to be. It was a fun job and actually a pretty nice way to earn a living. But I, all that time was investing on the side and loved it so much that I went in and said, I'm going to leave architectural engineering and sales. I want to be a stockbroker. So in 1968, 67, excuse me, I went to work for Dean Witter, and they opened an office in Denver, and that was the start of my investment career. It was really amazing, and of course, since then, I was a broker from 68 through 72, managed money from 72 to 74, went back as a stockbroker in 74 through 1992, then came to work with you and with your dad, Don McElvaney, down in Durango, because that seemed to make sense, and I'll explain later why, in the gold and silver market, and did that. 
up until 1998. And then at that time, 1998, I went to work with Jim Rogers. So it's been a neat long career, and it's been a lot of fun. And the only thing different in my life from any stockbroker you might have known was that I was what you call a position broker. I learned that because I read Jimmy Rogers' book back in 1965, and I looked at the other investment positions, how people did it. Warren Buffett really made sense to me, believe it or not, in 1965. His stock was about $150 a share back then. It's currently, I think, about $30,000 a share. But Warren made sense because he'd buy things when nobody wanted them, and he'd keep them a long time till they were worth something. So as a position broker, that's what I did. And that, that gives you a background. My job was to build a position in the stocks one at a time for my clients, usually to hold them two or three years, and then sell that stock and look for the next place to go. And the goal was to double or triple your money in that kind of a system. And you could do it if you were buying something nobody wanted. This has a little bit of relationship to today. If you're buying something that nobody wants, if there is a future for it, sometimes you can do quite well with it as an investment. So that's just a quick summary of where I've been, and today is the most exciting time in my life. It hasn't changed. <laughs> Looking ahead, this looks like a lot of fun. Does that make any sense to you? Absolutely. You know, I mean, the lessons you've learned, some of them the hard way, have never been reserved just for yourself, whether it's financial lessons or other life lessons. You know, the, the Jimmy Rogers partnership was very intriguing. Maybe we've got some time to talk about that later. But I think of how you saved Kevin here in the office from losing sight in his eye. You lost vision in one eye and many years ago shared with him what he needed to know to identify what was going on, a detached retina. And he would not have known what to look for, even though his father had experienced the very same thing. Mm. But that conveyance from his father to him never happened. So, you know, what do you watch for today? I think the same is true in the markets. What do you watch for today? What actions does that incline you towards as an investor? Well, the fun, it, again, it all relates back to looking back. If you look back at what I was doing, the whole game, and Jimmy Rogers explained this in his book, and so did Warren Buffett, the whole game, if you're involved in investing or anything else in life, to be honest, is if you can, instead of talking about today or complaining about what happened yesterday, you look ahead about two years, and we'll be talking about that later in this interview because we're in a very, very important part of that game at the moment. But you look ahead, so with my eye, it was amazing. That was 30 years ago. And I didn't even appreciate, we take so many things for granted that will come into our conversation today. Your body and how you feel and what you do, up until you have a problem, you take it for granted. When I lost my sight in that eye, I all of a sudden realized what a beautiful thing it was to be able to see. And I couldn't fish anymore like I used to because I couldn't see the four-pound test leader, but I could take pictures and do photography. So I really had a, <laughs> a whole new picture and a new place to go. And that's kind of how I tried to do my whole life is... If one thing fades away, then what can you find out there that is interesting and might be a lot of fun to do in the next year or two? And, and that's the game, the way I see it. I don't know if that's a good answer to your question or not. Well, yeah, looking ahead two years, I mean, this is one of the reasons why Doug Nolan and I are working together on the tactical short. Uh, it's one of the reasons why your son and I are working together relating to, you know, gold shares. It's one of the reasons why we're interested in, as you said, not necessarily what has happened just in the recent past or what is happening even today in the present, but with some work of imagination. I mean, if you can visualize or try to anticipate what is ahead, that's where you begin to see an opportunity unfold. Right. You have to position ahead for that. Right. You just mentioned something that's fascinating to me. How did I ever even land on gold? Why would a guy with architecture do that? I got a book just by accident by William Rickenbacker called The Death of the Dollar. This fits the question you just asked. This was in 1968. I'm working as a broker at Dean Witter. For some reason, I pick up this book and read The Death of a Dollar. It's an amazing book because he went through and said, we only have a few years left before the United States goes broke. And he explained it all and very clearly and straightforward. And it was a really beautifully written book. That's where I got interested in gold. So when I was a stockbroker at Dean Winter, I started buying gold stocks in 1969 and 70. I was buying Campbell Red Lake. I was buying dome mines. The people in Chicago called Denver office and said, why is this guy buying gold? Where did he come from? From that point on, I was a position broker, as I mentioned. But from that point on, I really believed the story that we were spending more money than we were taking in. And think for a minute, that was 68 or 69. 1971 was when Nixon said, the gold is flowing out of here so fast. 
as foreigners are turning in their dollars and converting it into gold, that we no longer will exchange T-bills or dollar bills for gold. We shut the window down for all the foreigners as well as people in this country. And then, of course, 70 to 70 to 1980 was just an amazing time. You know, gold went from $35 to $800. So if you were thinking ahead, now, what you just mentioned is fascinating to me because Doug Nolan has been doing that. I started reading Doug Nolan in about 1996 or 98. An amazing guy who really understands the credit markets. And the credit markets are just a history book repeated over and over again. And I'm sure Doug has said the same thing to you. So once you understand that, you say, I understand that cycle. The cycle is simple. And then Doug and I would both say to you, the only thing tough for the cycle is the timing. The timing of the cycles is next to impossible. So as you look at a history book, it looks easy in the history book. But as we live it today, the timing of what we're going to be talking about is always a question mark. You know, one of the interesting parallels that you and I share, and I hadn't realized this, not knowing when you went to work with Dean Witter, I went to work with Dean Witter in 99. Mm -hmm. You went to work with Dean Witter in 68, and here you're at the end of a bull market, arguably started in 1949, ended in 68. And you had a real rough patch in equities from 68 to 82. Right. You know, really punctuated with a recession in 73, 74. But I started right on the cusp of a bear market. And it, I think to me, it's left a, a valuable impression, but certainly an important appreciation for risk and what can happen rapidly in the equity markets. I just thought it was interesting that we came in, both of us, with <laughs> Dean Witter there at the tail end of a bull market, at the beginning of a bear market, secular bear market. In my case, it was really easy because they weren't managed markets. The Federal Reserve wasn't anything we'd ever heard of or cared about at that point in time. They weren't a headline every other day. And so we were looking at, there really was a cycle back in those days, which was a presidential cycle. It was kind of a four-year cycle, up and down and up and down, and a four-year cycle, because whenever you Somebody wanted to rerun for president. They tried to have the economy look good six months before, kind of like the Supreme Court right now. So in any event, there was a political influence in the market, but there was a free market. It was fun. And by the time you got there, they already had invented the plunge protection team, and you had a lot of obstacles and different things to think about than I did. That's true. Well, it is one thing to say the system is rigged at present or even just for a period of time. It's another to imply that that will never change. And I think we'd agree that, you know, whether it's via the plunge protection team or other means, that there certainly is elevated prices in the asset markets at the end of a deliberate effort. And if that never changes, then we truly are past the point of having free markets. Right. It seems to me like the rigging of the system at present really is the confluence of large leveraged players on Wall Street who are allowed their outsized positions due to a very highly accommodative monetary policy backdrop. And maybe add to that a regulatory environment which has allowed traders to stay well ahead of regulators. Is this a fair assessment that regulators are behind the curve, that leveraged players are pressing for advantages and driving volatility? Just like long-term capital management, they were benefiting massively from penny moves here and there because of the leverage involved. Does that go on indefinitely? I think the simple answer certainly is no. I mean, it's the same with long-term capital. The long-term capital in 1998 was run by two guys who got the Nobel Prize and probably were as good, supposedly brilliant in economics as anybody in Wall Street or maybe in the world. And They were so brilliant that, as you just said, they ran the leverage curve out to the very point where all of a sudden they had one tiny little mistake. And in a leveraged environment, if you're leveraged 100 to 1 or 500 to 1 or even 20 to 1 and you make a mistake, you know, 20 to 1, you can only afford a 5% mistake before you've lost all your money. So today, I would multiply those numbers and that leverage by 100 to 1, and you probably would too. You know, we're looking at the leveraged markets, which are huge. The bankers are the focal point of the leverage. And then beyond them comes higher leverage with $10 billion hedge funds. That's a lot of money. And one man and one computer operating a hedge fund. And those are highly leveraged as well. And you're saying to yourself, can they ever make a mistake or will one of them someday make a mistake? The catch with a mistake is once you make a mistake, you have to cover it, which means you have to sell something. And as soon as you sell something, which might have a lot of value in a very fine sound being, when you sell that something to get out of your trouble, you create a problem for the next guy who owned that thinking it was solid forever. And all of a sudden, somebody just sold it and the market is dropping and he's got to get out of what he thought was a treasured investment as well. So I think in answer to your question, I believe that. Now, some people don't, but I believe we're very, very close to the end of that game. And, and you can explain it in numbers and in zeros because 
the banks have come up with a way to insure all that, David, so we don't have to worry about it. And it's called derivatives, and they say we all sell derivatives back and forth, which are just insurance policies between the bankers and the hedge funds. And those derivatives now measure one and a quarter quadrillion dollars worth of derivatives insuring me and my paycheck and my bank account and what goes on in America. And that is kind of a scary statement, I think. Well, it's... I don't know what a quadrillion is, to be honest. You know, there's beauty in complexity. It seems like within the financial markets, there's also a cusp event where you go from seeing the beauty of complexity and what can be accomplished with it to the horrors of complexity and, you know, a system from which you cannot extract yourself fast enough. That's well said. You're right, 100%. You probably remember, because I, when I was writing articles for your dad, I came across something from a fellow over in Italy, and he wrote about how empires come and go. And one fellow who came up, and you've interviewed him since, I believe, came up with the thought that complexity was the answer, that empires or nations start at the beginning, build a beautiful system, put it together, everybody works hard. The thing gets more and more complicated as they go along, but everybody goes along and they build, they have rapid growth. And then at some point in time, it seems to cost more and more money just to stay even in a complex society. And I just came back from Denver yesterday. I was in Denver all day. I drove in a string of cars that was at least two miles long on the old Denver Colorado Springs Highway. Two years ago, I could have driven down that road at 70 miles an hour. Last night, I came home at about 15 or 20 miles an hour halfway. I think that's probably a good explanation of how complexity does catch up with you, and all of a sudden, it either slows you down or it costs a heck of a lot more money just to get the same thing done. And it would seem like America is approaching that, and I'm a very cynical guy at the moment because as I watch Congress and watch the congressional hearings and listen to what they're doing with the one Supreme Court nominee, they've wasted, in my mind, six weeks or three months of congressional nothingness talking about something so simple as the Supreme Court justice. And I thought Congress was there to govern and to manage and to plan ahead for America. (laughs) Maybe I sound like I have a problem, David. What do you think? Well, I think you're pointing to the fact that they were never intended to be circus conductors. They have work (laughs) to do, and it's not running a (laughs) three-ring circus. You mentioned Joseph Tainter. The Collapse of Complex Societies is a fascinating book. I think it's a must-read. I would would put it as as required reading if you're interested in the financial markets and sort of the ebbs and flows of history. It's fascinating, isn't it? And what you said, and you've you've said already a couple times, you look back in history, and all of a sudden it comes right out and shouts at you that that might have been, you know, in Rome, you can go through the Roman Empire and how it all started to unwind, and we might be starting to unwind here. You can certainly argue that with a lot of people, but it's worth thinking about. What it suggests is that we have seen success in the past, and that you can't draw a straight line from the past into the future. There are many things that can occur in the interim which cause interruption. And in the case of complexity, it's the cost of complexity that Tainer's talking about. And and in fiscal terms, you get to a point where citizens look and say, it's no longer worth it for me to participate. I'd prefer to migrate. I'd prefer to move on. And so what he describes as complex or collapse is not really what we would imagine as a 1929, 1932 style stock market implosion, that kind of rapid collapse. It's just that you see the height of complexity reached and then all of a sudden the disappearance the disappearance of a society altogether. I would relate that to you now. I don't know whether this relates or not, but we're having fun talking, so I would bring it up. I would relate that complexity to the debt picture in the world today. I really would, because I think a lot about it now. The whole world is living on debt. We know that now. Back in 85 or in 2000 with the dot-com bubble, every other nation wasn't in debt like the United States, but today we are. And if you think for a moment, I add to that every day when I use my plastic card. I've been thinking about it just in the last couple of days. Whenever I use a plastic card, I go into debt that moment, and the assumption on the other end at the filling station is that they'll get paid at the end of the month because I'll pay up on my debt. So if you thought for a moment, you'd realize that the whole world and 85% of the transactions in America today are debt-oriented transactions. And then you say, throw in on top of that the complexity idea that you just came up with, and you'd say, can this go on forever, or does somebody make a mistake somewhere, and does the whole thing come tumbling down? Which is worth asking. And the plastic and the debt are just a promise of something that people hope they will get in the future, right? <laughs> so it's really interesting, I think, to look at it that way. The debt in the world is the same way. The, the Treasury, I just saw it two days ago. For the fiscal year 2018, Treasury debt was $1,271,158,000. 
uh, it goes on and on. It was $1.2 trillion, which the Fed borrowed $8,172 per American working person. So if I worked and made $8,000 last year and just gave it to the Fed, they would just break even. They're going in that kind of hole for every one of us every year. I think it's the last eight out of 11 years they've had over a trillion dollars in debt. I think that's a complex system. <laughs> what do you think? And it works until something goes awry. And with a system driven by people and arguably even driven by smart learning computer programs, right. there's a variety of assumptions that go into how we operate. And ultimately, something does go wrong. That hasn't been solved. We live in an imperfect world. We're imperfect people. Historically speaking, that's 100% true. Some people always think it's different this time, and I guess that's why everybody... And then the other thing I look at, David, which I know is true, is that we are so far in the trap now, and maybe you've done that yourself at times, if you get far enough into something that isn't working, you just want it to go on one day. You just don't want to stop. <laughs> you, you can't stop. And I would say personally that the world and the United States of America on the debt cycle are into that position right now. The Chinese and the Russians and the Germans to some extent, but I think some people are waking up to the fact that they would kind of like to get out of this debt machine if they can, but that's just a very difficult question to see how you would do it and not just upset the whole apple cart. So we're at that point right now where there are some big changes right on the horizon and you're not quite sure where they're going to come from. Well, so let's talk present tense and then future tense. You're just back from an annual event that serves to update the gold community about what changes are afoot in the mining industry. It used to be called right. the Denver Gold Conference. Now it's in the Springs at the Broadmoor, beautiful old hotel. You're there most years. What was different this year, and what does that suggest to you? I'd give you three quick answers. One, I've been going to gold conferences and since I went to Jimmy Dine's conferences out in San Francisco in 1973 and four, so it's been a long time. Those were investor conferences where people went to learn about how to invest in gold and silver and mining. Then I went to financial conferences from 80 to 2000, which were mainly just all over the world, actually, about people learning what was happening in the world and where to invest. And then these conferences, the ones now that we're mentioning, there's both an oil conference and a gold conference in Denver, which we're just lucked out because I live here. And they're major conferences in the year's time. And in both cases, these are producers. So people get a picture of what's happening at the gold conference and at the oil conference. Each oil company or gold company has 20 minutes to explain what they've done over the year and what they're looking forward to. They have questions and answers and then a breakout room. And so you get a good chance to look at the industry itself. So they're not touting you on the investment and they're not telling you why you should invest in gold or oil. But in this case, the gold conference is basically a group of miners getting together. There's about 500 people there. And I'd guess better than half that group are miners. A good number were very large investors. I only met one fellow, an S&P man from Canada who worked for S&P. I didn't see one analyst, one gold or silver mining analyst from any major Wall Street firm there. So that's kind of the backdrop. The answer to your question is, we in the past, let's go back three years, three or four years ago, it was fun and everybody was expanding. And, and by 2012, they thought it would never stop. By 2014 or 15, when we went to the conferences, we go every year, they were all really trying to figure out how to stay alive. Most of them had overexpanded. They bought too much land. They had too much exploration going on. Several were on the edge of going broke and did go broke. So that all happened in the past. This time, amazingly, this brings us up to date. This year, the people at the conference were very quiet and peaceful, and the only people there presenting for their companies, from my standpoint, were in good financial shape. They were in balance. They all were looking at producing gold at $800, $900 an ounce, and they were saying today that they could break even or just make a little money, and they were all saying, if we can only get to $1,400 an ounce on gold next year or the year after, we're going to make some real money. <laughs> which for people who are gold believers, that's an awfully low number compared to what we think it might go to, which is why I go to these conferences. There's great leverage in a gold mining stock in a bull market over the price of just a gold coin, but there's also great leverage in a gold mining stock in a bear market going down. It goes down twice or three times as fast as a gold coin goes down. So they're at the bottom of that cycle right now. There was little interest. After each speech, there was very few questions. We only saw Four or five people even asked a question. So it was the most subdued meeting I think I've ever gone to, to be honest. As far as the people in the audience, they were very quiet. Well, a couple of things that stand out from what you just said. One that very scarce was the Wall Street analyst there to poke questions 
at those producers and you know figure out where the opportunity lies. You're talking about an area on Wall Street that's kind of been left for dead. That's right. You nailed it when you said that. That's right. That's amazing to me. I don't think I've ever met a research person at that conference from a major brokerage firm. And they have a, a cocktail hour the first night and you get around and meet a lot of people. So it is really interesting. There's no, no interest from the major brokerage firms and maybe it never has been in gold and silver mining. And maybe that's part of what we want to talk about today because in America, gold money gave a talk at luncheon. Gold money is based out of London. Gold money had an interesting talk. It wasn't wonderful, but it was interesting. But their comment was that in Europe, but more specifically in India and in the Orient, People buy gold, one, because it's jewelry, but two, because they know it's wealth. They wear their wealth on their bodies, which is true. We all know that. And he said in the West, and particularly in America and the Western countries, people have forgotten that completely. All they do is buy gold for jewelry, but they have no tie with it in relation to wealth or money, most of them at all, which I think he's probably right. I don't know. What, what do you think of that? <laughs> it was interesting flying back from Germany and London a week or so ago. I sat next to a gentleman and his wife sat down next to him and she had this beautiful gold necklace on from India. And I said, that looks like a necklace I've seen also made in Thailand. And she said, yeah, it's a similar style. I've always told my grandchildren that if they see the length of my necklace shrinking, that something has gone terribly wrong. <laughs> and, and the design of the necklace is to actually be able to use this in sort of gram quantities to transact business with. And, and I said, I am so glad you're having that conversation with your grandchildren. That's amazing. And as it turns out, it's not a surprise once I I got to know the couple and he had just retired. This was their first trip in retirement and he had just retired from being a mine engineer and geologist for 40 years. And, you know, he lives up in Grand Lake and has spent his life between Vancouver and Toronto raising money for various mining projects, gold and silver mines. And so, yep, they appreciate that you wear your wealth and sometimes under the right or perhaps wrong circumstances might have to use it. You know, this is the scariest <laughs> if you want to be concerned because I know, and you do too, I know that 99 out of 100 Americans today are so complacent and they take so much for granted. <laughs> it's just like me when I had two eyes. When I got that one eye, I actually had to change my lifestyle. But you don't do that. As long as you can see out of two eyes, you never give it a second thought. When you get down to one eye, it does alter. There are some states right now I wouldn't be allowed to drive a car in. <laughs> That's fun to think about. I can still drive my car here with one eye. But in any event, we're looking at the same thing in America when it comes to gold and silver and real money. There's been really an amazing campaign since maybe the 70s or maybe 1932, who can name when it started, to unwind people from any belief in real money and to believe totally in government and government created debt as real money that we can use every day. And that's scary because people, if we ever lose the paper money or the credit card, which I think we will, I think there'll be a day when the credit cards stop working. I think that'll be the biggest shock in the history of America personally, because people will say, what do I do now? You know, Jim, this is again, kind of in anticipation of the future. This is one of the reasons why we launched our vaulted program, you know, where you can on your smartphone, assuming that we have connectivity and there's certain aspects of the world as we know it in continuance, you have access to ounces at the Royal Canadian Mint, but can move money back and forth between your regular checking account to pay bills or do what have you. And if you decide you don't want a, a large balance of cash in dollars, you can instantly move it That's to amazing. kilo bars in the Royal Canadian Mint, in an increment. If you want if you want a 5 or $10 increment sitting there in gold, this is something your grandkids can have their own savings account, but it's real money. Now, see, that's the other question I'd ask you. That is marked to the market every day. So if gold did double or triple or quadruple, as Jim Sinclair thinks someday soon, then your bank account goes up that much as well, right, if you're holding it in gold? Yep. See, that's amazing if people sat and thought about that. <laughs> it's the most reliable store of value ever. Because frankly, if the price of gold is doubling or tripling, really what that is is commentary on the demise of our currency. And you need that increase just to maintain purchasing power of the things that are most important to you. Now, I mean, this brings me back to something that you were writing about and thinking about back in 2002, an article about real things 
versus just paper assets. And, you know, that article back in 2002 was highlighting the differences between a deflationary depression and an inflationary depression. Maybe you could tell us kind of what the main takeaway was. And here you are post NASDAQ crash and in the early stages of a Greenspan reflation. You gave us a little commentary earlier on who you were working with. I think Jim Rogers at the time. What was that article about? And what was the main takeaway? Well, Rogers was starting at that time his commodity fund, which Jimmy was pretty good at stuff like that because you know that from 2002 to 2006 we had the best bull market in commodities I've seen in my lifetime. <laughs> That's when oil went from 20 to 150 dollars a barrel, so it was a pretty amazing time. So back at that point in time, there were many analysts, and, and Bob Prechter was one, and I'd followed Prechter. Prechter was very, very good with the Elliott Way. We used and worked with him in the early 80s, and he was right on the button every time he did it, and it worked right up through 87. And then from that time on, in my mind, the Fed or the plunge protection team started to work off of what he was saying and try to do it in reverse, which made it a lot more difficult. But the long and short was, he had written a very fine article, and many other really good financial analysts at that point in time who were still, you could buy a lot of newsletters and, and read some pretty interesting people, and they were all saying, we're going into a depression, and a, a depression like 1932. And in that kind of a depression, you want to have your money in bonds or in savings or in cash because all of a sudden there are many banks and many bonds that go into default. And if you can keep your money alive, your money will buy a lot more. So that was the idea of the depression and the deflationary depression. If you look at history, that only happens once out of every 10 times. And the other nine times when you run into this problem with money and finance and all of a sudden overdo it with debt and with paper money, you go into a hyperinflationary depression. And that's easy to think about. Hyperinflationary depression means that all of a sudden the price of things are going up fast. And they're going up because people don't trust their money anymore. Half the $100 bills in the world today are outside of America. When people outside of America decide they don't trust America quite as much, they'll buy something with those $100 bills and they'll be flooding back toward us. And that means if they are, the price of what they're buying will be going up and the value of the $100 bill will be going down. And if you read what's happening in Venezuela today, 2,000% inflation, maybe a million percent inflation next year, which means that your money just goes kapoof overnight, and the money has no value. So at that point, you have to say, if that happens, obviously the bonds have no value, and all of a sudden you're in a hyperinflationary depression. Two things at once. And you can see how that happens, because the price of everything that you want goes straight up through the roof, and the price of everything else has no value whatsoever. And so people chase what's going up, and they have no interest in everything else that's going down. So it puts about two-thirds of the people out of work because nobody wants what they've got. And the other one or out of ten, if they're lucky, a few people have money and can keep on buying, but the price goes up so fast that that's difficult too. So if all of that happens, that was a hard explanation. It might have worked, it might not. If all of that happens, prices go straight up through the roof like Weimar, Germany, and if they go straight through the roof, you've got to say, if I'm setting money aside today or setting savings aside today, it might be wise to put it aside in something real that people will need and use in the future. That's it. That's the answer. It's really fun. And when you do that, I do it with people now when I talk to them. When you do that, you'd say, well, what do I need in the future? Well, the first thing, obviously, is food. <laughs> food has to be number one on the list. I talked to people yesterday. That's why I was in Denver. And I said, gee, you know, you really, if you can't do anything else, they, they weren't wealthy people. But I said, if you can't do anything else, you want to set aside quite a bit of oatmeal because you can live on oatmeal for a year. It's got everything vitamin-wise you need, and you can have three dishes of oatmeal a day, and you'll survive. And it's very easy to prepare, and it's no problem. So food would be the first thing. But then if you have extra money, you start looking around, and you say, well, I might want a gold coin or a silver coin. Obviously, your dad did pretty well, and you did too, building that empire. But then if you go beyond that, you can look at other things that then start to fit into a barter system. And barter is an interesting word because that means you're going to trade something you have to something somebody else has that you need. So if I have a shotgun shell and live in Denver and I need a dozen eggs and I know where the egg farmer is, I can take my shotgun shell out and say, you're a farmer and you may need the shotgun shell to protect your farm or to shoot a hawk. And in the meantime, I'd like a dozen eggs. So you then go back into the very simplistic barter system. Now, I don't know if I explained that very well or not, but that's something that is worth thinking about. Well, I mean, that partnership with Jim Rogers focused on real things, the things that people need. It was just a commodity fund. That's right. Yeah. And it, what it suggests is that you were more concerned with an inflationary outcome. Because we went into semi-hyperinflation because the commodities went straight up, and that means the dollar went down. I heard somebody yesterday, which is really interesting to think about, and he said, instead of pricing gold 
in dollars, you should price dollars in gold. And if you price dollars in gold, in 1932, you could take a gold coin and you could buy 20 paper dollars. Today, if you take that same gold coin that you have down there at McElvaney and convert it to paper dollars, you'll get 1,200 paper dollars. I mean, if you can twist your mind to think what you just said, you realize that the paper dollar has gone from $20 and 32 to 1200 It's been diluted that extent over that time. So instead of talking about how many dollars gold costs, we ought to talk about how much gold a dollar costs, and dollars are fast becoming worthless. <laughs> Did that make sense? Sure, sure. Well, I mean, I think when we entertain the deflationist perspective, and we did that with Robert Prechter's team a few weeks ago in our commentary, I think it's a helpful exercise. And from the standpoint of intellectual integrity and honesty, it's very important to look at things from multiple perspectives. But you've been following Prechter for 30 years. You mentioned that you successfully traded using the Elliott Wave and Robert Prechter's advice from 80 to 87. The Elliott Wave is a great idea. I agree. He was really good with it. But the deflationist view concludes with that dominant allocation to dollars, typically in the form of short-term treasury bills. If the view is right, you're kind of the last man standing with the wealth of the world at your fingertips. But what if you're wrong? What if you're wrong on the deflationist conclusion? If you're wrong, then saving a dollar bill becomes worth as quick. And if you look at history or look at Venezuela or look at Argentina or look at Turkey or look at Indonesia, that's happening right now as we speak. They're paper currencies. See, that's the catch, and it's so simple. If you're sitting at the Fed today and you see this start to happen, that is that people don't honor your debt or don't like your debt, what would you do? You'd raise interest rates. We saw a big jump yesterday in interest rates. If you're sitting in Argentina today, they're paying 40% interest on their national debt right now. If you buy whatever would be a treasury bond equivalent down there, the interest rate is 40%. 40% would mean that anything that you had as a bond that you were holding that had a 6% coupon – would be tremendously devalued. It might be worth only two or $300 compared to its $1,000 face value. So that's the catch. And when you bring it up, most governments, when they get into the fix, which is happening as we watch, you can watch Venezuela, which is gone now, or you can watch Argentina, which is the sixth time this has gone around in the last 50 years, they're doing it again. You can watch the currency disappear. And you have to say, if I don't have something real, I'm lost. And if bond rate goes to 40 and then to 50 and then to 90 percent, then the whole debt structure is destroyed. And the debt structure in the world, I think, is about, I've heard, I don't know, I'm sorry, I don't know, but I think it's five or ten times the size of the stock market. So you wipe out that much wealth that quick. And Bob Prechter would be right. You'd say, gee, if I still got a dollar, it'll work. But if you didn't believe in the dollar, and if the governments tried to counteract that by printing and printing and creating with a computer money out of thin air, which is what they did in 2008. In 2008, the governments around the world, 2008 through 2015, created about $50 trillion out of thin air to pull the thing out of the slide. Then you can realize that the money can be diluted down to where you're in a hyperinflationary depression. Well, when I think of the inflation-deflation debate, I've never applied Pascal's wager, but that's essentially what we're doing. If you're wrong on the deflationary argument and you're in dollar assets and liquid government bonds, you're wrong and you're doomed. Everything's gone. That's right. On the inflationary side, if you're wrong and you own a real asset, whether that is a farm in production or a piece of gold or silver, if you're wrong, the outcome is not as extreme. You're exactly right. It could be devalued to some extent, or it may not be, depending on what it is. But if you're wrong on the other side, you lose everything, which is why it's really an interesting time at the moment, because that's right where we are in America, as far as I see. I think that's the other thing I would say to you, which we should bring into this, and that is people have been saying this ever since I read The Death of the Dollar. At that point, he said, we've only got five or six years to go. I got to know Harry Figgy. Figgy International is one of the most successful and really well-run companies in America. And Harry Figgy wrote a book, Bankruptcy 95. I read all of these, obviously, because I'm interested. But Harry did the work, sent people all over the world to study hyperinflation and inflation and how countries ran out of money and what happened. And he said, we're going broke in 1995. And his book was a bestseller. The interesting thing now, because you can look at me and say, Jim, how can you and everybody else be that wrong? And so I've given that deep thought, and I'll give you the answer. The answer is, we believed in good and bad and right and wrong. And we believed in rules. There were rules back then. And it's my opinion at the moment that in financial markets 
And I think we can see just recently in government that they pretty well have forgotten all of the basic rules. And it's turned into kind of a game of every man for himself. And if you don't have any rules, then what you and I are talking about is very difficult because you have to make choices based on no set standard that you're aware of. You just have to guess. <laughs> and then you start to look at history and say, well, what are the odds of this versus that happening? I think that's how you have to do it. Well, I think, again, looking at history, if we're in that place where there's no rules, no measures, and as you say, it's every man for himself, then we're very quickly moving towards a period where it's sort of might makes right. Because eventually my interests and what I need is going to run into conflict with someone else's interests and what they need. And maybe need is the wrong word, but want, because greed is a factor here. It's so obvious to me. I see that every day on the highway. Every day when I get on between here I live in Monument and going to Colorado Springs, the speed limit says 75. Every car on the road, including me, at my age, and you you know my age, 86 years old. At 86 years old, I'm driving 80 to 85 miles an hour down that road in a string of cars just to stay in the flow. That's stupid. <laughs> I happen to know how your reflexes work when you get older. That's stupid. Now, when we hit the construction section, which we always hit, which is between here and the springs, it says 55 miles an hour, fines doubled. At that point yesterday, when we went through that section, most cars were going 75 to 80, and one fellow went by us at 90. So what scares me the most, David, about everything we see around us is that people all of a sudden don't really seem to respect or worry much about the law anymore. And that's a very concerning thing. We see that in the stock market. The stock market used to be an investment place where I would buy a stock and three years later, if I was right, the company would have grown. We both know that today the money in the market is a $10 billion hedge fund that's trading between now and noon to see if they can take the money out of some other hedge fund's pocket. That's too bad. <laughs> what else can I say? I think there's some things that are changing. And I hope it's for the better. It could be for the worse in terms of an investment portfolio initially, but for the better in terms of the social and political ramifications down the line. Something's changing. We've got dollar strength, which is triggering weakness in the emerging markets. We've got rising rates, which are starting to impact debt rollovers and the structure of that complex system we were talking about earlier. So we don't know the future. But you are beginning to see signals. I mean, we talked about the $10 billion hedge funds. We have two hedge funds in the past week, both north of $10 billion in assets. They're shutting down and giving money back to investors. One of them stated they're doing so because the markets are now treacherous. Their words, not mine. Yeah, I think that's right. And I mean, this is a clearly a divergent view from the mainstream media and the average Main Street investor. But does that signal anything to you when a few smart money operators don't like what they see on the horizon and it's promising to be dangerous or treacherous rather than, you know, the nirvana which we've had with, you know, low rates and excess capital? You know, I've looked, you look at Apple stock and it was two dollars in nineteen ninety four and now it's two hundred dollars and you say it's gone up a hundred times. Or look at any number of stocks in the tech sector. Another point that really to me is interesting on the reverse side of that, which is really worth thinking about, is that Paulson, Paulson was a, one of the biggest hedge funds out there and one of the most successful. He had one of his fellow that managed the gold mining section of Paulson Funds last year, spoke at the conference and gave an amazing speech, very interesting speech. And then about six months later, Paulson announced that they were discontinuing their gold mining and their silver mining sector of their hedge funds. They no longer wanted to be there. Then you come up about two months ago, and Vanguard, which is the largest mutual fund in the world, announced that they were discontinuing their gold and silver mining fund and would put it in the natural resources, but would no longer focus on gold or silver. It would be more in the natural resource sector. So, you know, this is my old game. You look at when the last people leave a sector that you think might have some future value and say to yourself, gee, if they all went home, then the sellers are gone. The biggest sellers who might show up have gone Somewhere in the future, we might find a buyer. Interesting to me. Well, so you wrote me a note a few weeks back, and in it you said that everything I wrote about in 2002 can be multiplied by 100. Something very big is around the corner, and not one in 100 American people can visualize it or is ready. And you went on to say, I wish I was 50. I wish I was 50 years old. I would like to be working with you. Would an explanation of why why you, you, you want to be 50 and doing what we're doing, help our audience appreciate the kind of opportunity that you see unfolding? Well, I love change and I love opportunity when no one else sees it. <laughs> That's what I've done all my life and it made a living for me. 
So I've never seen it at this point ever, no matter whether we talk about NFL football or football. You can watch football either four or five out of seven nights of the week. The whole country has gone into very, very focused and narrow ranges of interest. And to me, that is setting up an amazing opportunity. And I don't know how this all turns out either. But I do know with this much change, and in my view, the whole culture in America has changed in my lifetime. I believe that for sure. And I believe the biggest changes came about first through television, where people could sit and entertain themselves at home through television. And then recently, the change with the magic boxes and the cell phones is huge. You see six people go to dinner and sit at a dinner table, and they're all looking at their cell phone or at their little magic box, and they don't even talk to each other. So the culture in this country has changed dramatically, and all I know is that you can either really get depressed with change, which is easy, or you can say, if it changes this much, something big is going to happen. And what I said to begin with, if you can figure out what people will need and use in the future, and the fun of being in the investment business is helping people position themselves so they can sleep at night, and you're trying to help people get through the day and get to the next day. And I know that's what you and your business down there do. And that's the fun. (laughs) Is that an answer to you or not? Well, it is. It is. When you say that what you saw in 2002 with your concerns about the difference between inflation and deflation and the probability that, in your view, the higher probability of an inflationary outcome, how do you translate that into practical positioning in this day and age? You know, here we are 16 years after you wrote that. How do you reflect on what you wrote on 16 years ago? And what do you do in light of that? I think everybody gets a different answer, to be honest with you. But I think we're 100 miles further down that road. I don't think we can go back. You know, I'm an old guy now, and I know all of a sudden I I realize that you never can go back. (laughs) In Denver yesterday, the traffic was unbelievable. I wouldn't live in Denver for a million dollars today. I've told people if you told me to go to New York tomorrow for a million bucks, I wouldn't go because I happen to really enjoy what's around me and the world around me, and I don't want to just be in a big crowd. The answer to your question is that you realize that we're in a very precarious and fragile position in our lives, even though we take it each day for granted and assume every day is going to be the same day after day. And yet you know down deep that there's a chance that may not happen. I don't care whether it's a storm or a semi or a tornado or a financial crash worldwide. There is a chance for something really big to happen. So if that were true, you would say two things. You'd say, what will I need personally for myself and my family? What would have the best chance of survival? Obviously, if you look at sculptures and art, the prices, I know paintings that were $3,000 in 1968 that are worth $200,000 today. So I guess looking back, that must have been a good place to put some money into art. I watch people with their electric cars, and I can't believe what's happening there. I don't understand it. But I know what's happened to the price. I, I wouldn't say that's what I'd do today. But today, I would be looking first at how can I help people around me because I want to be employed. My son always says, my biggest problem, Dad, is cash flow. He has a family. I'd like to have some cash flow. I could go into long distance talking about that. It could be as simple as starting a plumbing firm. I don't know anything about plumbing, but I know that when people's plumbing goes bad, they have to have somebody else come and fix it. So I think that's going to be a pretty good place to be in the next five years. And I'd like to have five plumbers working for me, and I just answer the telephone. I think I could probably make a living. Now, that's a dumb answer. Silver and gold? Silver and gold coins go back 5,000 years. And silver and gold coins right now are being collected and hoarded by Russia and China because they want a silver and gold money back system. Right at the moment, the yuan is being used to buy oil from Russia and from Iraq. And when they pay the people in Russia or Iraq with the yuan, they have the option at the moment to take that yuan right into a Chinese bank and convert it into gold. So they have already moved. China is the biggest energy consumer in the world, ahead of us now. They buy their oil and gas from those two countries, and they pay them in yuan, and they immediately convert it into gold. I think it tells you where we're going in the future. We'll go back to real things. I think it also suggests conflict, because you're talking about a system that we've benefited from, centering on the U.S. dollar and the U.S. debt markets. And to the degree that you see a shift in control, or a shift away from our control towards greater autonomy, those two countries, in particular Russia and China, moving away from the strong arm and long arm of the U.S. Treasury Department, there is, you know, underlying tensions there that ultimately will express themselves. Well, you know, I look at it, it's just simple in my eyes. You look back at America and why we were so strong and so good, and of course we were the major factor in World War II, and from that point on, the dollar was supreme. The dollar was gold-backed currency, which meant 
foreign countries could convert their dollars into gold up until 1971. So it was the strongest, and most of the countries around the world, because of the war, were bankrupt or broke. So the dollar became the standard of the world and worked up to 1971. Then in 71, when we went off the dollar standard, we were really up in the air for a minute. And Henry Kissinger was a brilliant guy. He went to Saudi Arabia and said, let's make a deal with you that we'll price oil in dollars from here on. And he made the deal. And so OPEC, from that point on, all the oil countries said, we'll sell oil to anybody in the world, but we take our pay in dollars. It's so simple. It's scary. So still, the dollar was then kingpin of the world when it came to money, because everybody would have to convert their currency, whether it was a pound or a, a rand or whatever it might be, into dollars before they could buy oil. So there was always buying pressure to buy the dollar in order to get oil and to sell the local currency in order to get dollars. That's coming to an end as we speak right now. That's the exciting part of what we're talking about. In the last two years, that all has started to change. China and Russia both want to go back to a gold-backed currency. It's obvious because they both... Russia had their reserves, as every other nation did, in treasury bonds. And that's how they saved their money because it was the strongest place to save money. Russia in the last two years has sold all but about 5% of their treasury bonds and converted all that money into gold. Now, I'm not here loving Russia. I'm just telling the real world... We were the kingpin of the world because the world did its business in dollars, and there's great strength in being the banker. It would look like in the next two, three years, or maybe even sooner, there will be a direct change in that, and the dollar will no longer be used in international commerce like it has been. It was 98% of the commerce was in dollars. It won't be that way five years from now. I'm quite sure of that. And if that's true, then nobody will need the dollars that they used to need to do these things, and therefore, what is a dollar worth? $120 trillion of future debt obligations for Social Security and Medicare. <laughs> Interesting, huh? <laughs> well, it's fascinating because where we started the conversation is by talking about the things that we take for granted. And in our financial system, we take the dollar for granted. We take our currency, the base of all of our transactions for granted. We've assumed dollar stability. And I, what you just said, I think, is, is absolute. I'm going to quote you on this. It's so simple. It's scary. How easily it works. But if it's that easy how it works, how easy is it also to change? Because it's so simple, it's scary. So, I, I mean, we do have a system that's very complex. It's based on a few very key fundamental elements. And those fundamental elements are shifting. Even if to a small degree today, actually in a complex system, it doesn't take very much of a shift to have significant major ramifications. Oh, well, as you said way earlier, everything is leveraged to a great degree. Now, we're in the midst of the biggest change that you and I or, or the world will ever see as far as I'm concerned because the whole financial system is ready for a change. You look at America, and it was the American empire. And I'm sorry, most people wouldn't know what that meant or wouldn't want to say so, but it was true. We had the empire and we ran the world. And if you look at that, it happened with two things. We ran the bank, so we had the money everybody had to use, and everybody had to stay with our money. And number two, we had the biggest defense department and the biggest army in the world and the most up-to-date army in the world. And, and you know, it scares me because the complexity thing you mentioned shows up with Trump, and it's too bad that it did. He was proud of the fact that he got $700 billion for the defense department to spend this year and I've also read since then that there was already $300 billion in the pipeline. So on defense for the year, we're going to spend a trillion dollars. That's gone way beyond the point of no return. And then the scariest part of all is that there's two or three new aircraft carriers, which some people would say, I'm not sure that's current with what is going on in outer space or, or weaponry. <laughs> anyway, that's a whole different subject, but it all adds up in dollars and cents and complexity as well. And we seem to be losing, well, you can't spend a trillion dollars a year on defense. It doesn't make any sense anyway. Well, I, I think one of the things I appreciate about our conversations, both on the line and off the line, is that, you know, although you've been in love with the game as it relates to money and investing going back to the 1950s, 1954, 1955, and then professionally from 67 forward with Dean Witter, you don't love money. This is, That's the true. game is interesting to you. <laughs> But the love of money is not so – why would you waste your life loving something that does not love you back? <laughs> that's the most important thing you've said all day, <laughs> and I was blessed. See, I think that's a blessing. There, there are several blessings in life. One of them is we have four kids, and we have one daughter who most of her life, she's 55 now and doesn't do it as much, but she always looked over her shoulder at what other people had. 
I was blessed. I never did that, David. <laughs> it's a blessing. I have nothing to do with it. God gave me that. I just didn't happen to look over and say, oh, he's got more than I do. I can't believe what a gift life is, honestly, and what a gift life has been to Barbara and I and our family. And money was way down the pike. You know, I earned a living so we could go out and go fishing or go hunting or so we could enjoy our, our life at home and have something good to eat. <laughs> and money and power were never in my focus. Interesting. But that's a blessing. I think some people really do. You know, people I talked to yesterday at lunch were really neat older people. We were talking about, they said, why are they doing what they're doing in Wall Street? And I said, it's money and power. There are some people who are born with an instinct that they want more money and power. You look at the Clintons, I don't want to badmouth anybody, but you look at the Clintons, and I think they really enjoy money and power. Would that be not fair to say? Sure. And I think one of the advantages that you have in life is that not only the legacy you've created, but the legacy you believe in is oriented towards different intangibles. Love, integrity, what you've shared generously, uh, whether it's in this program or, or with your clients through the decades, you're a teacher. You've valued giving more than taking. And power and money oftentimes is about taking, not giving. I was just, again, blessed with parents because for some unknown reason, I realized that if you could do something that people needed and wanted, you would get a reward sooner or later. I just know that. I know that. <laughs> That's my being. If you can help people around you, I know. And I, I watched it in business. Some people would work two or three or five or 20 years at something that didn't seem to make much sense, but they thought it was helping other people. And sure enough, it all showed up and, and they had a pretty nice life. And on top of it, they had the great satisfaction of accomplishment, which is a heck of a lot better than just trying to add up your payroll each day. Well, as always, we enjoy having you in the commentary. Good ideas, I hope. If they help anyone, that's wonderful. And it's fun to talk with you because you've got some great thoughts, and I hope you stay with it. Thank you, Jim. It's You know, you were one of the earliest contributors to the commentary almost 11 years ago, and I enjoy going back and listening to the archives. Those are some of my favorite conversations, and I uh, appreciate you being willing to continue to share as you have through the years. We have fun. Thank you very much. You've been listening to the McIlvaney Weekly Commentary. I'm Kevin Oreck, along with David McIlvaney and our guest today, Jim Deeds. You can find us at McIlvaney.com, M-C-A-L-V-A-N-Y.com, or you can call us at 800-525-9556. This has been the McIlvaney Weekly Commentary. The views expressed should not be considered to be a solicitation or a recommendation for your investment portfolio. You should consult a professional financial advisor to assess your suitability for risk and investment. Join us again next week for a new edition of the McIlvaney Weekly Commentary. 